Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Greg, it's a pleasure to have you on my show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Well, the name's Dr. Greg Polgrain from Brisbane, Australia, and uh, I've been teaching Southeast Asian or particularly Indonesian history and politics since the 1990s. And uh, in the in the part of my research, I came across Kennedy's involvement in Indonesia. So I... Uh, that's how the book came about, JFK versus Alan Dulles. It was Indonesia I was interested in, and Kennedy came. Kennedy was the intruder. I, I got interested in Kennedy as a result of Indonesia rather than the other way around. Yeah, when, when um, I came across your in, book, in Brisbane at present. When I came across your book was the first time I've ever even heard of Kennedy's involvement in Indonesia. Um, and your title of your book is JFK and Alan Dulles, um, and it centers around this area in Indonesia. And I'm hoping... Yeah, Battleground I'm, Indonesia, yeah. I'm yeah. hoping you could uh, explain a little bit about what was the importance of Indonesia to Kennedy's administration? What was the importance? Why is Alan Dulles involved? Because I need some background on these characters, on especially this topic that I've been so interested in for the past couple of months. Well, Kennedy became, when he was president, the very first day in office, he had two crises on his desk, care of Alan Dulles, he, he arranged them. One was Cuba and the other was Indonesia. But in America, we only heard about Cuba. Eh? The Indonesian problem was that the island of New Guinea, which is the biggest tropical island in the world, was divided into two. And the, the western half, they call West New Guinea, was a Dutch colony. And when Indonesia became Indonesia in 1945-49, it was the Netherlands East Indies, and the, the Dutch granted independence to Indonesia in 49, but they kept the western half of New Guinea. So a sovereignty dispute developed between Indonesia and the Dutch went on till 1962, and Kennedy's involvement came about because that that problem on the desk that he he was confronting him when he first came into the White House was um, there is a problem and with this sovereignty dispute because Indonesia has acquired a huge amount of weapons from Moscow, aeroplanes and ships, and they're going to use these to confront the Dutch in New Guinea. And USA was an ally of the Dutch, so it would mean a repeat of the cold, whole Cold War scenario over sovereignty of West New Guinea. And Kennedy had just been through Bay of Pigs, which Dulles really handed him in the in the first day of office as well. It was all set up for Kennedy when he when he arrived as president. But so was this confrontation. So was this crisis in West New Guinea, which was really pitting U.S. alliance with the Dutch, a NATO ally, against Indonesia with Moscow support. So. Kennedy resolved that crisis by handing over West New Guinea, asking the Dutch to leave, and handing over West New Guinea to President Sukarno. You know, it was 1962, August 1962, the New York Agreement, they called it. But that was only half of what Kennedy was, I call it his Indonesia strategy. Half was placating, placating Sukarno because the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, was probably the biggest political party at the time and quite vociferous in their demands for the return of Netherlands New Guinea to, to Indonesia. So half, the other half of Kennedy's program was first of all to stop the confrontation. So it, at least Sukarno acquired West New Guinea or Netherlands New Guinea. But then the second half of his plan was to pour in US aid and get Indonesia on side in the Cold War. So all the criticism that Kennedy got for handing over West New Guinea or, or getting the Dutch NATO ally offside by asking the Dutch to leave New Guinea, 
he was hoping to repair that political damage by then bringing Indonesia on side in the Cold War. So he was planning to win in the end. But what happened was, just as the New Guinea crisis was settled in 1962, and he started, he sent over Professor Humphrey, I think, to assess the economic uh, potential of uh, where the best aid could be delivered. He, he was proposing civic aid. He was going to get the Indonesian army to provide civic aid, building bridges and roads and helping people increasing their standard of living. And by that means, and he would have been successful too, by that means, he was hoping to decrease the PKI, the in Indonesian Communist Party, was getting lots of support because the people were impoverished. They didn't have control of the land. And by increasing the standard of living, Kennedy was planning to decrease the in intake for the PKI. And it would have been successful, but it would have taken five, six years or so to really show some change. But as soon as the New Guinea crisis was settled, the sovereignty crisis, another crisis began between Indonesia and Malaysia that was controlled by British, British colonial power, and they wanted to decolonize Malaya, and that's how Malaysia became Malaysia. What started was called Malaysian confrontation. It was basically a dispute between Indonesia and Malaysia over the rate or the manner in which the British were decolonizing. You know? And that got so bad that Indonesia was arguing or it's small skirmishes. It wasn't quite a war, but the US Congress opposed Indonesia's involvement in in skirmishes in, in their fighting with British troops in Sarawak. And on that reason, they stopped Kennedy's program for pouring in US aid. So this threatened Kennedy's whole Southeast Asian program, not just Indonesia. He, his plan was to settle Indonesia, bring it on side, and then look at Vietnam, Laos, whatever. Yeah? But he, he had to look at Indonesia first because it's four times bigger than anything else in Southeast Asia. With It's a huge country with a huge population. And it was far more important than any, any other, even Vietnam is far more important. And because the US aid was stopped, Kennedy, after several months of negotiation, resolved with President Sukarno, Indonesia's president, to make a personal visit to Jakarta. And I got this in writing from Dean Rusk, former Secretary of State uh, of Kennedy. And uh, Kennedy was proposing to make a visit in early 1964. And the deal was he was he and Sukarno together were going to stop confrontation, confrontasi, they called it. And by that means, he would be able to then resume US aid and his program would be resumed. But had he done that, had he made that visit, he didn't realize he was really causing a problem for the alternative plan that was already, already in operation. Alan Dulles had started a plan for regime change in Indonesia but way back in 1958. And he Kennedy was getting into hot water. He didn't fully realize the, the depth of involvement of Alan Dulles in Indonesia. You know, as I mentioned, I mean, before, uh, Dulles had been involved in Indonesia since the 1920s. You know, he was involved in intelligence before Kennedy was born, you know. So Kennedy was really getting into difficult terrain. And even, even more than that, confrontation, Malaysian confrontation, Kennedy didn't realise, and he certainly wasn't told by Alan Dulles when he was, when he was in, for that one year, he was in charge of the CIA, Director of Central Intelligence. Kennedy didn't realize that Malaysian confrontation started because Alan Dulles was involved in starting confrontation. He arranged for a CIA gun runner, a fellow called um, uh, uh, Texas Star, Frank C. Star is T A W R. He called himself Star of Texas. He he delivered two thousand small arms to Sarawak to an underground communist group. Well, actually, it was delivered by a fellow called William Andreas Brown. He was CIA in Singapore at the time, who's fluent in Chinese. He was picked for that job. And he gave the 2,000 small arms to the Chinese communist organization, mostly young adults, you know, teenagers, young adults. 
And so they they had the CIA weapons, well, weapons, we'll call them. And when a revolt began in Brunei, which is a few hundred kilometres north, British troops came from Singapore. They didn't go to Brunei to sort out the rebellion. They went straight to Sarawak and chased these young CCO, they call them, communist group organisation, chased them across the border into Indonesian territory. It caught the attention of Jakarta, and that's how Konfrontasi began. It was a trap for Indonesia. It was thrown on their lap, and they didn't investigate fully, and they became involved in Konfrontasi. It wasn't Sukarno. Sukarno was not involved in the start, and, and a US ambassador, Jones, fully informed President Kennedy, Sukarno was not involved in starting, but he wants to stop it. So with Jones's help, Ambassador Jones's help, Kennedy resolved to make that trip to stop confrontation at the urging of Sukarno, at the urging of Ambassador Jones. And they planned early, I think January, February, early, early 64. And the actual agreement, even though they were negotiating, Sukarno and Kennedy were negotiating for several months about all the details. And it had been agreed, and the top army man called uh, General Nasution, he'd he was he'd gone to New to Washington to talk about security for Kennedy's visit. And just when he arrived in in Washington, Kennedy was shot. It was the day two two days before Kennedy's assassination. This particular, um, it was officially announced that Kennedy was going to make a visit, but actually he'd been planning it, and and Dulles would have known about it months earlier, you know. So, well, they released his, was, they released his trip to Dallas, I think, in the newspaper, which is the first time they've ever done that, and it was a couple of days before, I think it was the nineteenth or something like that. They put it, they posted it in the newspaper. They've never done it ever since um, that change of route that they had. But I mean, Dulles is everywhere with these regime changes. I mean, he's in Cuba, and that's the one that we know about, at least in the, in America. But we talk about the backdoor channels that Kennedy opened up. Kennedy opened up backdoor channels between Castro. He opened up backdoor channels with Khrushchev. Now, he he did have a moment where he knew that, hey, if my backdoor channel with Castro doesn't work, we still got troops to get him, you know, plans to assassinate him. Sure. But Alice is Alan Dulles is involved in so many of these regime change style things. And you get into an inherited problem. That's what Bay of Pigs was. There was a bunch of inherited problems. I'm just curious. When you talk about Alan Dulles's regime change, did you look into the specifics of what he was planning or what he was trying to do? I know you talked about like arming some more communists. Now that's a tactic they did in Cuba, but I'm I'm just wondering how far he got with it all. Like how deep did it go? Did it get to a point where I mean anybody in Indonesia could easily point blames at the president of the United States, which would have been Kennedy, and think it was his plot to do all these things? No, no. Well, Kennedy was supporting the president Sukarno. And that was the problem by Kennedy's support for President Sukarno meant Sukarno would be president for life. There would be no regime change had he made that visit. So Kennedy was really getting in the way. Uh, and But the other, I was surprised because this was brought to my attention during an interview that I had with the former vice president of Indonesia. He'd just resigned in 1983, a man called Adam Malik who was a what they call a CIA asset huh? but uh and he was he was helping uh, CIA when he was uh Indonesian ambassador in Moscow in before he became uh before he returned back to Jakarta but um Malik when I when I interviewed him in his house in Jakarta he'd just retired from vice president's position because he was dying of cancer he died a year later less than a year later and so he was really keen to open up and tell me what was on his mind and th the only reason i got to see uh malik was that i'd previously visited tokyo to visit uh to interview a fellow there called shikatara Nish nishijima nishijima was the top japanese uh plane clothes uh, spy. Huh? Good for you for remembering all those names. I couldn't do that. <laughs> but he uh, it was interesting because Nishijima arranged the visit for me to see Malik. So that's an extra, because Malik was 
protege. Eh? Nishijima helped Malik during the war. It was uh, it was Malik that Nishijima gave the the radio to to announce Indonesian independence in 1945. You know, so Malik was a a bright boy, but he was he was uh, favoured by Nishijima. So when Nishijima told Malik that this this Australian person is coming to interview him, he was ready. He he wanted to open up. And he was telling me things in the interview. Sitting next to him was his adjutant. His name was Ati Yatman. And Ati Yatman was the man who uh, you probably heard um, CIA in Jakarta gave a list of 5,000 names of people. Have you heard that? Maybe not. Uh, Ati Yatman was the go-between. He, he, he passed the 5,000 names of the PKI communists to Suharto, and they were killed, basically. So he he was he was CIA. I knew he was CIA, but I didn't know Malik was CIA. That didn't come out till about fifteen years after his death. So when I interviewed him, I was really surprised. He's telling me these things about U two flights and the results of U two flights over the, the Chinese Soviet border and the or tank battles. And he was saying the Sino Soviet dispute was on fire, you know, and it was picking up and what people don't realize, even today, even though I included it in my book, care of Malik. Malik was saying that the events that happened in Indonesia in 1965, the complete destruction, physical destruction, one million people, more than one million were killed of PKI. They're only rice farmers, most of them. Most of them were, 95% of them were landless rice farmers. But because there were so many killed, it completely knocked out the PKI. It's it's been forbidden and destroyed ever since pretty well. But what it caused, what the massive destruction of the PKI caused was a bigger split, a bigger argument between Moscow and Beijing. And that's got to be incorporated into the understanding of why Kennedy's visit to Jakarta had to be stopped because the Joint Chiefs of Staff didn't want to miss this opportunity of splitting Moscow and Peking. And Kennedy's visit was a threat to that to that split or potential to split it, you know. And the person who brought this to my attention was Adam Malik, you know, and he felt guilty because, I mean, he was helping the CIA. He was helping Marshall Green, Ambassador Marshall Green. And he was, he was anti-PKI, but in his... Uh, you know, 30 years, 40 years, when was it, 83, uh, 25 years later, he, he realised something was wrong, you know. People are asking, but Suka Su Suharto could have seized power by killing 5,000 PKI, not 1 million. Why did he kill 1 million, you know? And the answer is that the more people, more PKI were killed, the bigger the split between Moscow and Beijing. And that's how it worked. And that's the work of Marshall Green. It's not it wasn't the work of Adam Malik. That's why he felt slightly guilty, I think, talking to me. And that's why he was pouring out his uh, thoughts. Well, he had, to con he had to confess his sins, man. <laughs> yes, I think it was a little bit like that. I Because when he's saying these things, Ada Yatman next to him said, but, but boss, you know, you, you shouldn't be saying these things. Please, please be quiet, you know, because he's saying giving him a few details. When I, when he was talking, I realized this, he must be connected with the CIA. But I, I didn't know that, you know. Anyway, he turned around to Adam, uh, to Adi Yatman and said, no, I'm talking to Greg. You be quiet, please. <laughs> he just told him to shut up. He, he'll say what he wants. He's the boss, you know, and he did. But I was, well, I'd have to say a little bit naive huh? because I wasn't ready for what he was saying. I didn't know anything about Sino-Soviet split at the time and what relevance it had for Indonesia, I totally unaware. It was it was Malik that brought it to my attention. So it took me a while to put it all together, but uh it's it was a it presents a far bigger motive, a far bigger reason for stopping Kennedy than I think anything else. So people point to the uh, Cuba and they point to the mafia and they point to this and that. But when you in when you look start looking at Indonesia and the fact that it's formerly the world's biggest colony, the richest colony, you know, and it's got the biggest gold mine in the world by a factor of, you know, two or three times. And that's, again, it was Daly's company that found that, that
that gold in 1936. And he set up the company in 1935 that in a 1936 expedition found gold in West New Guinea. And that's that was, I can't say it's the most important part, but I think the most important part is because regime change and the idea of splitting Moscow and Peking, that's why that's a very strong argument for getting joint chiefs on side. You know, if if Alan Dulles were to use the gold mine as an example, I mean, that's like personal gain for whatever company. It's the Rockefeller company that was involved. I mean, you know, Dulles is, both Dulles were working in the Sullivan and Cromwell. And I mean, that's like the, the, the front shop for, it's a legal firm in, in Wall Street, the biggest, yeah. And they're, they're the lobby, the, the front lobby for, for Rockefeller Empire of Oil, basically, in those days, anyway. And uh, so the Rockefeller interest really is the commanding interest. Uh, and the, it's when I mention Rockefeller, I think of the other incident involving a Rockefeller in New Guinea. I don't you would have heard of the death of Michael Rockefeller. Yeah. Yeah, the, by cannibals, uh, allegedly mm -hmm. by cannibals. <laughs> I like how you did the allegedly with the. I like that. That's funny. Well, I I interviewed I interviewed the man that Rockefeller was with when he disappeared, a Dutch, young Dutchman called Rene Wassink, a young anthropologist, and he told me what happened. You know, no, nobody else has. No, they've written several books. You know, I mean half a dozen books, and even a play I saw in New York on on the whole business. You know, they all leave the suggestion that it was cannibals. They all create the impression that these Papuans were, yes, there were cannibals, you know, but not at that time. There have been cannibals. When I was discussing this with General Nasution, who's a Batak, he's not a Javanese, he's from Sumatra, he amazed me when he said, yes, well, my grandparents were cannibals too, you know. is <laughs> the former head of the army telling me his grandparents were cannibals. My goodness, he's so forthright. I, that's why I sort of like, he'd done a lot, of, he did a lot of, bad you know nasty things and politically incorrect whatever you know he's he, but saying things like that you have to say my goodness you know he's quite forthright you know he's not he's so open Bataks are known for their openness and to say a thing like my grandfather was a cannibal you know and he himself looked into the death of michael rockefeller and said the explanation for cannibalism is nonsense you know that's from the head of the army and it, what actually happened was Michael Rockefeller and two Papuan policemen and Rene Wassing were crossing over a big estuary about 15 miles across. And just as they were going to meet a, meet some Papuans and get some wood carvings, that's what he was collecting, eh? get some wood carvings on the other side. But they got within two or 300 metres of the other side and this raging torrent of a river was so strong, Rockefeller had crossed at the wrong moment because the tide was coming in and it pushed the back of the boat up and it went under this raging torrent and the boat just went over, just tipped over. And even though there were so only a few hundred metres, the two Papuans were strong policemen. It took four hours to swim to shore, four hours. The, the two whiteys, Rockefeller and Wassing, drifted out to sea. They couldn't even begin to fight the current. It was such a raging torrent. But they drifted out all afternoon, all night. And in the morning, well, they saw the Papuans reach the shore. That's why it's four hours. And they waved and said, oh, well. And Wassing said, well, they'll get help. They'll get help. You know, be patient. Be patient. The Dutch will send reconnaissance aircraft. They'll find us, you know. But in the morning, the young Rockefeller panicked. He was in the middle of nowhere. And Wassing said, you could not see land anywhere. He, he, it was in a museum when he was talking to him, and he just walked in a circle, holding out his hand like this, no land anywhere, you know, we couldn't see land, and, and Rockefeller just panicked, you know, and he put a red petrol tank under his arm and started paddling against the current, thinking the current was the river. It wasn't, it's the coastal current. He was paddling parallel to the coast. I mean, Wassing said that afternoon, after in the morning he got... He left the boat, the Rockefeller left the boat in the morning, but in the afternoon, sure, reconnaissance, reconnaissance aircraft found the boat. They dropped a rubber raft and swimming from the upside down boat to the rubber raft, Wassing said he was terrified of sharks because he'd seen sharks. So I think 
I think he said, yeah, Rockefeller was eaten, but not by cannibals, you know, by sharks, you know, by sharks, because it was he was terrified. And he when he got to the raft, he said he was holding his hand, you know, those big rubber rafts thing. They, they've got a big, big side along with but he could he could hold his arm over the side, but he he'd had didn't have any energy to get in. He was his feet were still in the water. Then he thought of sharks. He, he just jumped in. He found the energy. <laughs> so yeah, but it's been the whole story's been uh, used against the Papuan people, you know, because they found the red petrol tank about 60k down. You know, they said, well, if the red petrol tank's here, where is Rockefeller? He's been eaten, you know, he's disappeared. They, he was eaten on the beach with Sago, they said, you know, nonsense. You know, it's like Robinson Crusoe. Anyway, he disappeared, and I, I think he either drowned or was taken by a shark. Yeah. He probably drowned. But yeah. It's a tragedy. I mean, he sh if only he'd stayed with the boat, he would have been alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about the Indonesia incident. Um, when you're looking through, what do you think, I guess, from your own more personal perspective of looking through it? Do you think that it was more of a or the reason why they denied Kennedy's, I guess, um, I would say objective for peace or, you know, objective for at least better communication, um, trying to build up um, over there a little bit better than, you know, do you think it's the fall of communism? Do you think it's like this idea that if we don't do something over there, which is if you look at Alan Dulles, like here's an example is Alan Dulles, everything and everybody I've talked to who speaks about Alan Dulles, the way that he thought about stuff was I'm doing things that people in America do not have the stones to do. People in the government don't have the stones to do. He was a patriot. So he's thinking of it the wrong way. The things where me and you might draw a line at like, Hey, that's a little bit unethical. He's like, I have to do what needs to be done to make sure we don't fall to communism. So I looked at all the rise up of communism back then. And I think like, if you look at Oswald, for incident, or for instance, um, him being blamed as a patsy or him being blamed as the alleged assassin of the president, all the FBI files, the NSA files, they all talk about that. We can't let there be a conspiracy, even though a lot of them agreed that there was a conspiracy behind it. They didn't think it was Oswald, but they, the media had spent all this time. And I looked at magazines, everything before Kennedy was assassinated. They were hyping up communism to this point where like people were scared that the, tomorrow they were going to lose everything they ever had. I think what I could relate it to would be like COVID in the beginning. Like that's what I could relate it to for my own experiences. Like we, everyone thought this was going to be something huge. It was going to be horrible. Everyone we knew was going to be gone. And when I look at communism, do you think it was this idea that we can't lose Indonesia? We can't lose any of that by this long strategy of communication because Russia will come over and take over, we need to do the same? Or do you think it was a money incentive? Because that's like the one thing about Cuba. It was basically like Las Vegas. It had this gambling aspect. Everyone was making so much money there. The mafia were, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, Indonesia had the third largest communist party in the world. Well, outside the Sino-Soviet, theirs was the largest. You know? 20 million followers. But 19 and a half million of them were landless rice farmers, you know, and they joined the Communist Party or supported the Communist Party. Actually, 3 million were joined, but the rest were supporters. Huh? But the PKI, the Communist Party, had land reform, and that's how they got most of their supporters. And it, nothing much happened in land reform, by the way, but the promise was there, and that's why they joined. Sukarno really didn't let much through all the PKI demands. So Sukarno was actually controlling the Communist Party. Sometimes he used them for support in his big speeches in the stadium with 100,000 of them, you know. It looked like he's, you know, the grand orator. Well, he, he was a good speaker, but Sukarno's really was, I think the CIA described him as riding a tiger, you know. one On the one hand, you have the army, and on the other hand, the PKI, and with Sukarno sort of trying to reel them in. <laughs> and had there been an election, the PKI probably would have won the election. But after 1955, when the PKI was number four strongest of the parties, there was another, no more na a federal a nationwide election. Eh? There were some smaller regional elections, and that showed a surprising increase for the for the PKI. And that's what gave we started to worry people that if there were a federal election, they'd win for sure. Yeah? But the other the other side of the coin there is what sort of 
communism was this Indonesian communism, because there was a report written by the head man in the foreign desk in London, who actually contacted me a year or two ago, and he's a 90 something, and he's one of these people who, you know, refused to <laughs> hand in the check. But he did say, we can't call the Indonesian Communist Party strictly, we can't call them communists, because they're not the same sort of communism as Europe is explaining. They're, they're Javanese. He called them Javanese radicals, Javanese, uh, what else? He said he'd be reluctant to actually brand them as communists, which is interesting point of view, because you know, we always hear them as you know, the PKI were very strong, communists, all the rest of it. Of course, they had uh, an elite that were in, in constant communication with Beijing and Moscow. But of all the political parties, I think they had one person who was university educated. Yeah? Aidit himself was A-I-D-I-T, Aidit. He was head of the Communist Party. But to give you an example of how he changed the rules, I mean, communism uh, is usually, is quite commonly accused of, you know, uh, not believing in God or having no God as a, you know, in their dogma. Aidit said, no, no, we're not ready for that, you know. So he said, no, we believe in God. <laughs> this, this Communist Party believes in God, you know. And it's interesting that the PKI headquarters every year celebrated Ramadan, which is the Indonesian celebration, you know, month of fasting and everything. So they were openly celebrating religion. They, they weren't. But yet the British managed, the British from Singapore were putting propaganda sending waves of it over to Indonesia on the radio and dropping pamphlets and things, saying, accusing them of being non-believers and infidels. And, and it seemed to work too, because perhaps Aidit didn't publicize the fact enough or strongly enough that uh, he he thought his PKI were still believers, you know, and they still celebrated Ramadan and things like that. When Aidit was a young man, he used to be the man in the mosque who would call people to prayer. <laughs> it's it all contradicts the the general accusation that Dalles was putting out that not only were the PKI strong in their communist belief, but that also influenced President Sukarno. And he thought he was always described Sukarno as a communist. Kennedy did not. Kennedy spoke to him personally, and he could see that he was a nationalist, you know, a strong, strongly spoken nationalist. And sometimes he would get help from the PKI, as I said, in the big big stadium. But he didn't let any PKI join the his cabinet. You know, they they some of them were some of the members were pro PKI, but they weren't members of the PKI. He he didn't let the PKI into that into that quarter of power. So he was controlling them, and that's I think Kennedy would have assessed that before he made his decision to visit and to support Sukarno. But Dulles, on the other hand, was relentless in his. So was Marshall Green. He used to call him a, a, a communist quite openly. Yeah? But it, it, it was because the, the end result was eliminating PKI. They, they did try to eliminate Sukarno, I think, seven times with assassinations, but it didn't. It failed. And they gave up that idea, then decided to eliminate Sukarno's strongest support who were the PKI and by eliminating the support even though there's a million of them or more that's how they got and that's how they re achieved regime change so it's an interesting different different approach in regime change instead of eliminating the leader directly they eliminate the entire support the leader has it's amazing how that that I, I remember uh words of uh Marshall Green, he was working under Marshall Green from the US Embassy, you know, he said he'd been working in uh, Eastern Europe for many years and he'd seen people terrified and people afraid of, you know, the, the powers that be, but never, until he came to Indonesia, when he saw people really terrified, he said they were dying of fear. Su Suharto managed to create such an element of fear that people were just shocked. They're still the Indonesian psyche today is still recovering from that horrible period that they went through in 1965, 66, 67, when people were just rounded up in the street and massacred, you know. Oppenheimer made the film, you know. You, you may have heard of that 
film that he uh it's basically about the killing yeah the killing that occurred and he interviewed some of the people that conducted the killing you know massacres uh were just in their blood they they still talk about it today as though it was some achievement openly on camera that's part of the part of the film you know and it's really difficult to look at sometimes you know quite difficult well when you look at alice alan dulles's perspective in all this do you see any like positives do you see this aspect of like if you look you just talked about the psyche of these people that are still damaged generations i mean if kennedy's strategy would have taken longer to do maybe a couple of years maybe longer depending on conflicts and you know sudden tensions there would have been no killing yeah yeah no the killing would not have occurred had kennedy's way kennedy's indonesia strategy been pursued that massive amount of killing in 65 66 just would never have occurred it, i mean it was the numbers as i said were so vast it helped the split between moscow and peking it explains why just this wanton killing occurred you know? they weren't all members of the pki I've, I've come across some people who were members of national parties but they were rich men in small towns they were considered rich men and Sometimes they were killed and then their land was claimed, reclaimed, you know, for somebody else because they wanted their land. Sometimes they might may have wanted his wife and they just killed him because they wanted the wife, you know. That's the sort of killing that went on. I I was recently in Indonesia in two months ago and by chance uh, was talking with a few people in the local village and uh, they told me about an event that occurred in 65 when the army took a lot of people along the bank of a river, this this has not been previously investigated, and I, perhaps I think it should. I told somebody in Holland about it, but there was a, just outside Mullum, 20, 25 k outside Mullum. One night the army brought it, uh, a lot of people. We don't know how many, but I was told there was shooting. They they took them down by the river and shooting, like not automatic fire, but bang 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 went on for ten minutes. So there must have been quite a lot of people killed in 10 minutes of individual shots. And uh, all the local people knew what happened, but everybody's so terrified. Nobody's ever really spoken out. It's still a, kept within that community. You know? But I mean, I spoke with some of the elderly ladies, well, I don't know, 60 or 70, and they told me that years later when some of the primary school girls were attending school, one of the phenomenon in the class was that half the girls didn't have fathers because they'd all been killed. And just terrific stories like that, you know. And and uh, when I think about it, another one was a woman telling me that her father was taken away. Apparently he was PKI and he was he disappeared. But the mother said, Oh, he's gone away for a while, you know, he'll he, he might come back, you know, but We'll have to live without him for a while. That sort of approach to the young children who were about 12 and 14 or something. The boy was 14. But after after that, they, the two children suffered such discrimination from local people, anti-PKI discrimination, because they were the children of a PKI person. And it, they, it hurt them so much that the young boy just took poison and killed himself. You know, that's, that's how it affected them. Yeah. And... The lady told me that she was so sad. This is like years later. She's at 60 something now, but she was just, she's still sad, you know. And uh, what what gets me a, a little bit angry is that when, I mean, the world actually, not just Indonesia, but the world believes what happened when Suharto took control in 1965, 66, it started with the death of six generals on the 30th of September, 1st of October, in that morning, 1965. And Suharto later blamed the PKI for that killing. And that's why he mounted this big campaign to seek revenge and, you know, and it started from, but it actually started from the killing. But when you, when I started research or looking into what actually happened on that night, the person that emerges as most likely culprit is Suharto. Suharto himself and his intelligence man, Ali Motopo. Ali Motopo was probably more involved in the actual events that night, but Suharto was his superior. He was head of Kostrad. 
And Murtopo is described as the architect of the new order. The new order is the new regime after Sukarno. Sukarno was the old regime. Then you get the new order under Suharto. And Murtopo was described as the architect of the new order. And because he was heavily involved in what happened on that night. And if you read chapter, whatever it is, seven, I think, in my book, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of the information is gained from people who were in jail and they, they uh, communicated with uh, other people who were involved. And it's difficult to get documentary evidence. I admit, you know, you don't, you don't can't go to the archives and find what happened. But if, if you trace what Suharto did that night or the previous day, you can see he was deeply involved and he's deeply involved. And I, I'm really shocked that I think the people that were involved in killing the head of the army, General Yani, Ahmad Yani, and the people who attempted to kill Nasution, they didn't get him because he jumped over the fence and escaped. But definitely Yani were not, or the person that killed them was not the person that was brought into the court and admitted, yes, yes, he said, I, I killed Yani, you know. It seems to be there were what they call uh, hitmen. You know, in Indonesia the word is preman. They they got, the trucks were going to pick up, uh, kidnap these generals on the on the night of thirtieth of September, first of October, and the attention was to kidnap the generals and bring them to Sukarno to explain this rumor that they were planning a coup against President Sukarno, but they, there was no planning for any killing. But somehow this all went wrong on the night and they got shot because certain hitmen got in the trucks at the last minute and they were included in the trucks as they went to the houses of the generals. And they were the ones with Thompson submachine guns who shot General General Yani. Yeah. He came down in his pyjamas, said, what's the trouble? You know, four o'clock in the morning. What, what's the trouble? He said, oh, the president wants to see you. Come now. He said, well... I'm in my pajamas, you know. I'll I'll go to go dress. And he turned around, and the Thompson put seven bullets in his back. He was dead before he hit the floor. Now it's interesting that Suharto could not achieve that position of, as head of the Indonesian army. He he was almost deputy under Yani, but he could only achieve that top position in the event of Yani being killed. If Yani disappeared and we nobody knew where he was, if he's kidnapped or he went overseas or something. Another general was supposed to take control, but if Yani was killed, Suharto, by this is army protocol, huh? Suharto was the man for the top job because Suharto was actually in control of troops. Was that known information that he had to be killed for him to take that guy's position? Because I feel like that's a great way for people just to suspect you for being the person that hired to kill that guy. <coughs> I put it, yeah, you have to read chapter seven, maybe, yeah. Yeah, people, some people say, oh, you know, what evidence? Well, that's army protocol, basically. Yeah, and if if they want to question me, they can question army protocol, you know? <laughs> it's there. And sometimes I don't have uh, archival, usually my form, my type of research methodology is based on finding something in the archives, getting the information, and if I can, track down people who were involved, whose names sometimes were mentioned in those archival documents. You can do this in Indonesia, not many countries, because the politicians there began so at such a young age, you know. I mean, 20s, they, they were top men in their early 20s, you know. So when I was interviewing them, anyway, when I, got, I was looking at the Brunei Rebellion, I'll give you an example. Brunei Rebellion was they say the spark that started confrontation that, that drew Kennedy in to make that visit. Huh? And they accused a Brunei man, the British accused a Brunei man called Asahari of starting the Brunei rebellion. But I interviewed a man, British intelligence, a fellow called Roy Henry. I found his name in the archives. <laughs> and then I made a few inquiries and I was surprised. Oh, he's living not far from Gatwick Airport, you know. <laughs> where I was anyway. So I, I arranged to have an interview. <laughs> it was luck, a bit of luck, you know. Anyway, we met we met in Commonwealth Centre in London, you know, and had a, 
had a lunch and talked and I produced the documents and I was I was reading something else. I was letting him read through a few documents. Yeah? And as he's reading, he must have come across the details that really showed beyond any doubt. What he, and I, I wasn't looking. I was reading something else. And he'd swallowed a piece of meat and it went halfway down his throat and he forgot to chew it. He was so engrossed in what he was reading. And he was choking. He, I looked up and he's blue in the face, you know, like choking. And the first thing I know, a waiter had walked, run past me in the in the restaurant and slammed his back, slapped him on the back. And this piece of meat went about three meters out like this. <laughs> and he's got, got breath and he came back to life. But it was a near death experience. <laughs> Everybody turned around and said, what the hell's going on? You know, he's gasping for air and piece of meat on the floor, you know, that he forgot to chew. And after that moment, he gave me all the details that I was asking for, it was like that. But most of them were in the documents anyway. But he did tell me, yes, the Brunei revolt was really started not by this man, Azahari, but by British intelligence. And he admitted it. But he said his man was deputy under Azahari. So he had a spy working under Azahari. And he was number two in the party. And that's how he managed to do achieve what he wanted. He was he tricked Azahari and blamed Azahari. And they accused Azahari of being linked with the Indonesians. And that's why Confrontasi began and well, helped Confrontasi. I explained before about what the British did about the weapons and things, but that was the real reason. But the British, as a result of this trickery, managed to get control of Brunei oil. If you know how rich Brunei is in oil, huh? it's they they convinced the Sultan that this honorable gentleman, Azahari, wanted he had he had ill intentions and but he actually as a harry was a remarkable person he i mean he was a brilliant orator and his idol his political idol was churchill for goodness sake you know <laughs> he's and they accused him of being you know in communist and all the rest of it and he's it, you can't you can't really be accused of that when churchill is your is, is your, your political idol <laughs> well how important do you think I would say it is because I'm all about the historical record. Like I, even if it doesn't agree with what I'm already thinking, I just, I need, I, for me, that's the whole reason I enjoy the Kennedy cases. I feel like that's a historical thing that needs to be corrected mostly because the history books are teaching you the Warren commission. They don't take account for the HSCA or the AARB, the work that they did to classifying documents over the past 15, 20 years or so. So I get into this point of, do you think it's important to teach the idea of what the idea of communism is you mentioned before about it's a different style of communism. And I think that's very important because as soon as someone hears the word communism, I immediately thought Russia, like Russia's communism, not a different style of it. I never even thought to think that. And there's other people out there, like, especially you got to, yeah, well, look at the whole period of time back then when someone hears the word communism, they're already assuming these bloodthirsty killers and they're not looking at like, oh, they must be anti-religious. They're all Satanists. No, they're not. There's communists that are religious. Mm, and it's like when you used to hear the term communism, it's like a monolithic structure, but it's actually quite uh, disparate. And I mean, that was the cause of the argument between Beijing and Moscow on on interpreting you know the the original communist doctrine now should they have world revolution well Mao Zedong thought yeah power through the barrel of the gun and he was promoting exporting revolution but but Moscow didn't have that approach and they disagreed on the way revolution should yeah so that's where the original uh, argument between the two began and of course aided the Indonesian communists they're not going to go anywhere they just wanted to sort out their own problems the main problem is that Java is the most overpopulated island in the world. It's, we think of China or India as popular, densely populated, but Java is, what's it, a thousand K long, and it's got about 160 million people. You know? It's quite densely populated. More than half of the Indonesian population are on this one island of Java. You know? And they're exporting Javanese into other other islands like Papua, West New Guinea, and it it's just causing so many problems. It's it caused a problem back in the 60s and it's still causing a problem today. 
I don't know whether you heard the news three days ago, but maybe you haven't, but in West New Guinea, some Indonesian soldiers have killed, they're still killing Papa, they've been killing them since the 60s, but they killed another four Highland people, but they didn't just kill them, they killed them and then dismembered them and beheaded them and then put them in sacks and carried, they were caught carrying them in sacks, you know, now the army says well, this can't go on. This is this is reprehensible in the extreme, and they're going to have a court case. These these soldiers involved in this terrible killing should be brought to brought to justice. But you'll find that having made that grand statement, there'll be no court case. They'll disappear, and nothing will be done. It's been that way. If, if it does happen, well and good. You know, I I would welcome a bit of justice in Papua, but. So far in the last 60 years, we haven't seen much. You know, I mean, the head Papuan who was killed, uh, oh, I forget his name now. <laughs> um, but anyway, he, he was actually, there was a court case and the soldiers who were held responsible were given six months, nine months, year and a half. But even that meagre period of imprisonment wasn't done. They just went back to the village in Java and then they rejoin the army after their time away. And that's what happened. So that's why there's no real punishment and killing keeps occurring. So that's Papua anyway. But Java itself and Kennedy's role, that's, yes, it's it's interesting that I say I didn't come, I wasn't looking at Kennedy myself. Huh? I was looking at Indonesian history and Kennedy came into it. And that's what got me interested because I realized had Kennedy's plan, Kennedy's Indonesia strategy, been carried out, it would have been a remarkably different history to what what we know occurred in the sixties and what under Suharto. Huh? Well, it's it's the hardest thing for people to believe right now is like I saying the military industrial complex, which is what I believe took out Kennedy. For a lot of people, they're like, why would our military do something like that? I'm like, well, you're thinking more of like a personal, like our government's supposed to protect us aspect. But I think if you look more at what Kennedy was doing, there was a lot of like this fear of communism, this tough on Russia attitude that Eisenhower had, that a bunch of people had. Dulles was a big proprietor of that, but also business aspects as well, too. I mean, before we started learning about cutting off resources and trading to make someone's whole civilization kind of crumble, there were these ideas of covert abilities, which was divisivizing a population to spark up basically against their own leaders, a way to do a regime change, a way to style them with weapons. And I come across all these documents on stuff. I mean, it's the best damn strategic thing ever if you don't mind the damage that gets caused afterwards and that's why i'm so phobia yeah. that's why i'm so on there for trying to understand these aspects of history because when you don't and it's why when i talk to anybody about the kennedy assassination they say that moment is when everything changed because they got away with it whoever did and I go, that's the issue is that it start tracking the events after 1963 and you start getting into an area of Watergate, you get into Operation Midnight Climax, you get into the Edgewood experiments, you just start seeing that this is a dark path that we're just continuing to go down because nobody has thought to correct and punish. And it's at this point, what you get documents released with nobody's name or somebody's name published in there and they're gone. Who's going to who, who, who gets punished at that point? You just let someone get away with it for so long. The coincidence of Dallas, the name Dallas and Dallas is <laughs> rather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, he did, Alan, Alan did visit Dallas. Was it five weeks before the assassination? I, he he did, went, from what I think I heard was that a month before, apparently he was in Rome um, around, I guess, when it happened. I guess this would. David Talbot said was gathering the assassinating squad or whoever, um, which were those mafia members that were responsible for regime change in Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's what I, I, I've never really, you know, involved myself with is the grassy knoll and things and who flew in and who flew out the same day, that sort of thing. But um, I, I did look at it in so much as George de Mordenshield, who was closely aligned with Lee Harvey Oswald. You know, and and the fact that Alan Dulles did visit Dallas before, uh, because he he gave a talk in a group that George Deborenshield was involved in, yeah, 
And but George wasn't there, he'd already left, of course. And the interesting thing was that when he did leave, he he uh he arranged for a big party and a group of people to come and meet Lee Harvey Oswald, uh to meet George de Morenshield arranged for a party to meet Lee Harvey Oswald. And in that group were all sorts of intelligence. Ruth links, Payne, yeah. good old Ruth Payne, why people think she's central intelligence. That's that's always the weirdest thing to me is you, Alan Dulles was fired by Kennedy, and then he was hired to be a part of the Warren Commission who was supposed to investigate the death of the president. But the Warren Commission had no other suspects besides Lee Harvey Oswald. So if you read the Warren Commission, it's literally like Oswald did it and we're going to show you how. But what this kind of enters the area of speculation. Um, what did happen, and this is where I start thinking a little bit differently about Johnson, um, is that he waited until being sworn into office once Kennedy – usually when as soon as the president dies, the vice president becomes president. That's immediate. That's exactly it's, – it's immediate. There's no – you don't need to do a process, a hand on a Bible type scenario, but we do that just because it's kind of more official to the people that are surrounding you to say, hey, this person is now in charge. But everyone knows that as soon as the first president dies, the vice president immediately takes over. Johnson waited to be sworn in as president until there was a judge and cameras on Air Force One. That's why we have that photo of Johnson in the plane putting his hand up and he's sitting standing right next to Jackie Kennedy and everyone surrounding him in Air Force One. And that's where I can get with people that think Johnson was a part of the plot. Um, only because there is that you he, he did not have to wait for cameras to be there, but he wanted to make an event out of it, like just like winning the Olympics. If you notice when they did that documentary about the Russian doping scandal, they went back to these athletes like 10 years later and was like, hey, you actually won first. Congratulations. And all the athletes responded with this. OK, I don't care about the medal. It mattered in that moment when you're standing on the first pedestal. But I never I lost that moment. And th this I think I think um, Douglas, the author, Douglas, he wrote Douglas Horn about Kennedy. He wrote about Kennedy. He did point out, I think, that... Uh, oh, you mean James Douglas. James Douglas. James, yes, yeah. Um, I think he he dug up an interesting point that uh, FBI J. Edgar Hoover informed uh, Johnson that when some when there's evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald had visited Mexico before and done it made in the Mexican... Embassy, the Russian Soviet embassy was it the Cuban embassy in Mexico, allegedly, and then come back and they, he had that link trying to implicate this Moscow in the assassination. Right? J. Edgar Hoover informed informed uh, uh, Johnson that it was not yeah. the man who went into that embassy was the wrong height. Have you seen that evidence? Yeah, I have the document. Actually, I was going to incorporate it in my film. It's yeah, this... it's as though he, he was, and if that was the case, then somebody was planning the assassination beforehand <laughs> to implicate Lee Harvey Oswald. You know? Well, they so, had um, Avardo, I think his name is. He was an agent, um, a Soviet uh, spy, whatever you want to say. He gave a story about, I knew it was Oswald in Mexico. And this is where the idea of Oswald, Oswald apparently was in Mexico. I think it was just at a later date. Um, but the, the one that they saw at the embassy, they checked the cameras, they checked everything. It was a person using his name, which if you look at a lot of these Oswald lookalikes, people were using his name all over the place. Like there were people mentioning him in his own town and everything. But this agent of Ardo talked about seeing Oswald and overheard a conversation of him meeting. And, and this is the documents recorded thing. It's not my words. It's the documents words. A red haired Negro that gave him six thousand dollars for the assassination of president kennedy and then they found out in an interrogation using some of the old things from the rockefeller commission like lsd interrogation they found out that avardo was actually lying and fabricated the story and hoover's memo is this document that explains that the point of j edgar hoover informing vice president or president johnson at the time the immediate implication of what he's saying is look out the cia is involved in this we don't know how just yet but look out and I, I think we have to take into consideration president johnson's reaction knowing that was he's dealing with something that's very dangerous he doesn't quite know what it is yet but i think people who want to implicate johnson yeah he's he's got a lot of 
faults and things to answer for. But once he realized that's the situation, he must have been walking on very, yeah, very dangerous ground. Huh? I, I have admitted in the past and I've said on recordings, I don't think he was a part of the I don't think he planned it, but I think he definitely did his best to cover it up once he found out. The well, reason... Yeah, you have to cover up. He couldn't he couldn't say the CIA was involved. I don't think it was the CIA. It was well, you, you certain. Wouldn't... You wouldn't do a plot. Persons. You wouldn't do a plot with an assassin, and then you would have your car right behind the where the shots are getting fired. In in the motorcade, Johnson was right behind. Even if he had a bubble top, the bubble top wasn't bulletproof, but people didn't know that. But Oswald missed one of his shots, and it hits a curb and bounces off the curb and hits a guy named James Tag in the face. That's where the the single bullet theory comes in. This bullet that goes through all these things. But if you get into this aspect, there's a phone call of Johnson and Hoover. And he goes, yeah, we got we got the three bullets that were fired. Um, we got them all, and they're in custody or they're in evidence or whatever. And he goes, where's any of them That's fired? That's the sort of me? detail. That's the sort of detail I, I haven't gone anywhere near. I've just what my book is presented is a motive for the assassination of Kennedy. It doesn't look into Grassy Knoll and bullets and even Lee Harvey Oswald. You know, I think I deal with him in one page. You know, just men have to mention it, but I've. I've always steered clear of that. I'm just presenting a motive for, and I'm saying more than Kennedy. I'm saying also UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld was killed by Dulles as well, Alan Dulles. Because when you look into the death, the assassination, the other assassination in 1961, Dulles has very strong motive again. And even though, um, well, he, he, he was deeply involved in the Congo eh? in in setting it up for intervention by UN Secretary General and then stopping Secretary General. The reason I found that out was, again, a little bit accidental because I interviewed the UN Secretary General's deputy, that is, Dag Hammarskjöld's deputy. Eh? Um, and he was living, he retired living in England at that time, but he said that Dag Hammarskjöld was more interested in solving that sovereignty crisis between Indonesia and the Netherlands, the one that Kennedy got handed after Doug Hammarskjöld's assassination. Kennedy had to handle it himself. But he was more interested, Hammarskjöld, UN Secretary General Hammarskjöld, was more interested in solving that crisis than he was in any problem in Africa. I mean, we all associate Doug Hammarskjöld with newly independent countries in Africa, rising up, joining the United Nations, becoming a united force. But Actually, as much as he was involved, he was really keen to sort out this Cold War problem that Kennedy had found on his desk on day one. And Kennedy and Doug Hammarskjöld got together, I think, April 28th, uh, 1961. And Kennedy asked Doug Hammarskjöld to sort out, but he had to do it discreetly because he didn't want, had Khrushchev realized Kennedy was getting the United Nations involved in this, it would have been very yeah. bad PR. And, but he did ask him to solve it. And Hammarskjöld was planning, he was on the point of announcing, in fact, that he was going to give independence to the Papuan people in 19, the end, the UN, the UN uh, assembly in the end, end of 1961, he was going to announce what his solution to this sovereignty crisis was. He was going to give the Papuan people independence and then assist them to construct a viable economy over the next six years by putting in UN experts into various departments, government departments. And of course, they would have had a wonderful economy because they had the world's biggest gold mine, mm -hmm. you know, just that they didn't know it, you know. The biggest gold mine, again, as I mentioned earlier, was the, found in 1936 by a company that Alan Dulles had formed in 1935, but he kept that very quiet, you know? Why would you, why would you, it's for taxes. You don't want to write that off on your taxes. <laughs> no, no, no <laughs> I kept it quiet initially. <laughs> they kept it quiet initially because World War II, the Japanese were interested, Adolf Hitler expressed an interest in West New Guinea. This is be before the war, but as soon as this gold emerged, they realized this is, dangerous because there were so few Dutch people in Netherlands, New Guinea, a few hundred, you know, they, there's no way they could protect this territory. In fact, Dulles 
convinced the the uh, the Dutch to grant him 60% control of this company that he formed because he gave them evidence that the Japanese were landing oil uh, oil craft on the coast and just going into the jungle and looking for oil, drilling for oil, searching for oil. That's why the Dutch agreed to give Daly's company 60% control and the Dutch 40%. They'd never done that before because they were in the middle of a depression, serious economic depression in the 30s. And the Japanese were getting stronger and they had no real defense against the Japanese. So they wanted American assistance. They allowed Alan Dulles basically to form the company. And that's what, uh, it was a Dutch name and it was centered in the Netherlands. In fact, I've brought this attention to quite a few Dutch people and they disagree, you know, <laughs> but they didn't even know that this Dutch company operating out of Holland was 60% American. <laughs> Incredible. Have you ever, well, have you ever seen the interview with Alan Dulles where they're in talking about his uh, job on the Warren Commission and he's smoking his, his famous pipe that he always had? And the interviewer asked him, have you ever done anything, you know, like uh, violent or you ever done anything wrong in your life? <laughs> no. And he, take, yeah, he takes that puff, <laughs> waits a second and goes, no. And it's the most like telling sign of just someone that is obviously just very, very in a bad route on a lot of stuff. And then you look at the evidence of all the things he's involved in. I mean, his motto, there should be a poster that just says like financially invested because every action he's ever done seems like he has to be financially invested to really care about. Um, I'm very appreciative that there's the people. I'll say I'm very appreciative that there's people like you that have written books about it and that have looked into this character because I think he's an important part of our history to really show. I wouldn't say the best side of it, but more of like the the real kind of nitty gritty aspect of it. Some, if you sort of analyze Dull Alan Dulles in a sort of psychological sense, you'd have to ask a few questions about that incident. I think it was in Schroeder's again, World War One, when Alan was in U.S. consulate embassy in Switzerland. And the British informed them that a woman working in the same office was actually spying for the Germans. And they wanted the Americans to hand over this woman and they, the British would deal with her. Alan got the job. He, and what he did was take this woman to dinner. <laughs> Before handing her over to the British, he took her to dinner and talking for a few hours over dinner. Then they walked up together up the up the footpath and of course the the Brits came out of the dark and grabbed her and she was never seen again. Why did he take her to dinner? Winder I mean, and dined her. <laughs> I mean, you might say, oh, it was, you know, make it put her at ease, maybe. He, maybe he was trying to find out a few details before the, the, the last details she gave or whatever, you know. Or what? I mean, it's just introduces just a touch of slightly unbalanced, you know, yeah, it was no, there's no evidence, but it just suggests it. Huh? So yeah. many people that have interviewed people that have spoken with Alan Dulles and have written books about it. They talked about how Alan Dulles's character was this charming guy. You yeah, know, he, did, yeah. he didn't, he came off, like, I mean, he's a provocateur in so many sense, but he just came off as like, you wouldn't be able to tell his motives. He had a very good poker face and, you know, people dropped their guard around him and then, you know, ended up going missing or something ended up happening to them. I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it's just like, I'm surprised that we don't know more about him in our history books. They, they don't teach all these things. They don't teach about Indonesia. They focus on a very, very small scale version. Obviously it's more condensed down, but when you start learning the real history of it, oh my God, you get into another one of, another one of the stories in the, one of those biographies was uh, the way that uh, Dulles used to give the first talk when new recruits came into the CIA. He'd usually introduce himself and, you know, say, welcome very much. And he'd say, now, the one lesson that I want you to learn is always answer the phone. It's important. And the example that he gave was that he was in Switzerland again, World War One, when he had a phone call, I think it was a Saturday morning or something, you know, which is out of office hours, but he was in there. And the phone call was a, some fellow called Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> and he didn't know much about Lenin. And Lenin, when he didn't get any help from Dulles, he Dulles said, oh, can you ring back on Monday? You know, this is the story. Eh? <laughs> ring back on Monday. Well, he couldn't because he was going on the train to the Finland station. He's going to, then going to start the Russian Revolution. <laughs> but, but, but 
he said, Lennon rang up on a Saturday and he said, oh, please, uh, can you ring back on Monday? You know, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> well, he didn't say that, but I got to, you know, he was, he was about to be taken by the Germans and in that encased train and, and sent back to Russia and they were hoping he'd stir things up. And of course he did, he started a revolution. But had Dulles seriously answered the phone, he said he couldn't do it at the time because he was going to play tennis with two good-looking Swedish girls, you know. <laughs> That's why he didn't pursue the telephone call. It could just be concocted, but it, it it seemed to work well year after year when he's introducing the story to the new CIA recruits. We call that the real motive would be plausible deniability. I can't answer the phone right now. I got some <laughs> yes. Swedish girls I need to talk to. But <laughs> yes. Greg, you've given me enough of your time, man. Um, I saw you had your book. Um, you showed it to me off air. Do you want to show it up on camera real quick and let people know where they can find any of your links, your website? Well, where they it's can on Amazon online because it's not available. How's that? I can see some of the title, but the blur screen, but yes, it's blurred. Yeah. But anyway, JFK versus Alan Dulles battleground, Indonesia. It's only available online Amazon because it's not COVID intervened. I'm afraid COVID intervened in a big way and it's not, didn't get worldwide distribution as the contract said, and it didn't get across the counter on the bookshops, even in Manhattan as the contract was supposed to do. It's, online amazon so um but anyway and it's uh yeah it's got a lot of uh new detail uh, new history in fact uh particularly chapter on suharto but even earlier chapters in 1958 on that's indonesian history but it features dulles dulles started a civil war basically and you can see how dulles psychological approach to, to to operating in in diplomatic affairs how it works because he often deliberately presented the facts that he failed his cia operation had failed you know but in fact he helped it to fail <laughs> and he wanted it to fail because the failure caused another reaction which is the one that he really wanted you know for example when the 1958 cia assisted rebellion was seen to fail Moscow then jumped in and gave Indonesia massive amount of weapons. And with the help of the CIA asset, Adam Malik and a few other people, he gave Indonesia weapons and that's what got the Dutch out of New Guinea. That's what embarrassed Kennedy. Kennedy didn't want to stand against Russian over, fighting over cannibal country, he said, you know, have a nuclear war over cannibal country, yeah. But anyway, Alan, JFK versus Alan Dulles, and uh, I hope you can get access to uh, online Amazon. I'm going to make sure I link all your links in the description. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Greg, and everybody, thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.